Well, I didn't know. Super. Let me just test that. Perfect. Good morning from Bremen in the SARM Institute. This is my colleague, Dr. Peter Grichmer, is an expert in hybrid propulsion, and I am Carlos Munoz Moya, and I work normally with monopropellants and liquid propulsion. Uh, this presentation we will cover different CubeSat propulsion systems and delivery system that we have some expertise here in SARM. Uh, we will be covering some existing hardware that is already being manufactured and is a system for CubeSat with different manufacturers known in the space industry such as Aerojet, Baco, Osiris satellites and we will give some ideas on what future developments are currently taking place in Europe. After we have reviewed that Howard, we will move into the use of propulsion in a CubeSat which currently we foresee as two different options. One, CubeSat with propulsion for the own mission of the CubeSat, such as attitude control system, station keeping, etc. Or another concept that we have before studied, which is to use a CubeSat or a CubeSat constellation as a test platform. Namely, for example, to test a one Newton range thruster in a space environment. In that logic, we will try to set a uh, bunch of requirements that the mission will need to cope with. Finally, my colleague will talk to you about our project called STERN, which is a sounded rocket that could be potentially used as a delivery system for CubeSat. Moving on, the first uh, system I would like to bring the attention to is what we call CAMS, which is a butane-based thruster based on MEMS technology, a micro miniaturized technology and can open different valves in normal liquid type of propulsion. We will see across this presentation that there are actually almost every type of propulsion that you can imagine has already been miniaturized for CubeSats. Second is for this example of a one millinewton thruster of classic hydrazine thruster that could be used and has been manufactured already by Parker that will be able to perform station keeping for example, in CubeSat missions. The next is the CHAMP system developed by Aerojet. This is actually a very interesting concept on one unit CubeSat, one liter, for example, of a three units CubeSat, which can give up to four different axis control and have different uh, nozzles behaving at the same time of, again, a classical hydrazine thruster. So it has proven to provide up to 300 meter seconds impulse and they have different possible configurations of the tankage. The final, the final actual existing Howard used this sort of uh, cylindrical <coughs> single axis as configuration, but they do have others in availability. Uh, another example of existing how is the SNAP-1, which is again a butane thruster, however this its storage goes into gasified liquid, so it's gaseous propulsion rather than liquid. It's uh, heated by an electrical system, as this little flow schematic shows us, uh, some pictures of the actual size and the actual integration in a CubeSat. Then going to coal gas with a little bit less of efficiency than the li normal chemical liquid propellant, we have a huge range of existing hours. So this is namely the most commonly used uh, mic mic neutralized type of propulsion for closest. Then, oh, I lost it. Then we're going to, after we've gone through liquid, coal gas, we're going to solid fuels, uh, in either in the way of cartridges or a small spheric fuel cell uh, in a Again, a large number of hardware available from 3 kilograms up to 10 kilograms of mass. This is already a bit outside of the range of a CubeSat, but the smaller ones are definitely in the range. The, av the advantages of uh, solid propulsion is obvious, it's reliable, it's usable, it's very common to as a single system. Uh, however, it's not reignitable and it's one use only. The impulse goes from 0 0.6 to 1.2 kilonewton seconds, which is will be very large for a CubeSat. However, the system does exist and it can be miniaturized. Um, from electrical, we have a lot of systems. I wanted to bring the attention of this mission that I've we found interesting is the Mars CubeSat mission uh, with an impulse of 44 newton seconds at a very, very high ISP. Other options is the normal vacuum arc thrusters or ion thrusters. 
new concepts. The new concepts go in the direction, there's an, an idea that's been studied in Europe in the last years, is to turn everything into green advanced propulsion. So uh, there is a big project running in Europe currently called GRASP, which is uh, green renewable so advanced space propellant which turn to turn everything that we're used to using hydrogen into new propellants. Uh, there is already existing hardware, not only in Europe, this central piece is then in Korea, I believe, then try to change our, for example, the CHAMP systems that we explained before by Aerojet into H2O2 through a catalyst bed in a miniaturized, either in monopropellant or bipropellant configurations. The main issue to hear is the actual miniaturization of MEMS if you want to go below the 1 millinewton range. Again, these thrusters can provide anything from 1 millinewton to, sorry, from 1 newton to 1 micronewton. Other hardware issues which are not related to thruster again are valves or tanks, which are the two main critical items when we talk on HAWA. Uh, the main issue is the high cost and they're very critical. However, there are already existing options. In terms of tanks, uh, the main challenge is its uh, integration and seating within the rest of the configuration. You need to remember that if you do bring up one of these propulsion systems, you're probably going to be looking at using one whole unit for your system. GRASS is the initiative that I was telling you before, has considered a large number of different green propellants that could substitute traditional liquid chemical propulsion. Uh, these are the main results coming from their study that we have selected their performance in the range of what we consider not as bare minimum within CubeSat. There are many pr options, but the ISP tends to be very low. So in the end, if we would like to use a green propellant, we will need to go into either a bipropellant configuration or a hydrogen peroxide configuration that is comparable to hydrazine. So, in this sense, what can we do now that we have decided to put a propulsion system in our CubeSat? What can we do with it? So, uh, the heritage available, for example, from Aerojet, has the men's availability, has existing concepts. If we wanted to do the same for green propellants based on the results from GRASP, we will have some issues on the MEMS system. There are efforts done in Austria by ESA and there are others in Taiwan and Russia. The road map to achieve a green propellant system in a CubeSat will be to try to reproduce the Aerojet chumps with H2O2. Bipropellants is also an option, but the heritage is not so common as a bipropellant system involves a more complex architecture. This will be the idea of a propulsion system with its given uh, power budget, pressure range, and the ISP that we expect from it. So the demonstrator for a, for a CubeSat with a propulsion system will be to try to aim to an uh, technology readiness level 6 or 7 in a space. We can do a th perform a certain number of, of tests in a space that we cannot do in Earth, considering the, the restraint of a CubeSat. For example, we could do electrical checkout, performance in hot firing, pressurization, leakage, thermal system test, and propellant storage. Uh, currently, we know them, for example, H22 presents some questions on its uh, long-term storage in a space. What is impractical to use a CubeSat in a space will be, for example, to prepare a, a burned life or lifespan test. So, of course, we cannot fully qualify a test in a space, a uh, thruster in a space with a CubeSat, but it's a good starting point to prove a concept. Other tests available will be material compatibility, vibration, shock, gas and liquid phase in a space for inside the tank, etc. Now I will give it to my colleague who will tell us that once we decided to build a CubeSat, put a propulsion system on it and run a mission, how do we get it into space? <laughs> okay. okay, thank you very much. Um, 
getting into space is very ambitious, of course. So this is this is just the very first steps and the very early steps um, to that point. Um, it had all started in uh, about April uh, 2012 uh, when the German Aerospace Asso Association (DLR) um, started a student uh, program called Stern, which is uh, Student Experimental Rockets uh, in German for short. And um, basically, eight uh, German universities are currently involved in this program. They uh, get funding to build. Uh, suborbital rockets at the moment um, to uh, and to design them uh, from from scratch basically the idea is to uh, foster uh, engineering talents and to get them to like space propulsion and space transportation uh, so that you can uh, teach the experts of tomorrow basically uh, on the living thing so they have to design the whole thing uh, it is actually like a whole uh, real space project with all typical phases of uh, preliminary design review critical design review all of those stages are in there and uh, as I said it's funded by DLR now um, uh ZARM or the University of Bremen is um, involved uh, with uh, our rocket called Zephyr, which is the ZARM experimental hybrid rocket. Um, it's a small uh, sounding rocket uh, using paraffin and LOX as propellants, uh, and we have an engine of two kilonewtons of thrust with 30 second burn time. Obviously, that doesn't get you into space, but it's uh, learning how to build small rockets which can eventually turn into small carriers for something like CubeSats. That would be the ultimate goal, I think, of. Uh, at least some of the groups to actually get into space. At the moment, it's very suborbital. Um, so we have a total wet mass of about 70 kilograms um, and a payload of maximum of 5 kilograms, but that's uh, pushing it. You lose a lot of uh, altitude, obviously, with your small rockets. And we want to be higher than the European uh, altitude record, uh, which is 12.5 uh, kilometers, roughly. So we want to be around about 10 kilometers. As I said, early stages. This is a technology demonstrator. Um, so that's why we're still very low, but this can be uh, increased in performance and developed further. Um, it's a two-stage recovery system, so we have a drogue chute and main chute to get the rocket safely back to ground. And uh, as I said, it's a des demonstrator, so what do you want to demonstrate? It's hybrid technology, for one. Um, hybrids have been lingering on the edge of application for a very long time. I think now, uh, with more and more development in that area, they actually present a good uh, alternative to uh, other propulsion systems because of their inertness and their safety for use. That's why they're ideal for such a su student program. Also, they combine the two things of solids and uh, liquid propulsion, so the students can actually learn both systems in some way, which is uh, very good. Um, we have uh, a lot of additive uh, layer manufacturing technologies in the rocket, because especially if you want to miniaturize stuff in a small rocket, uh, soon the manufacturing of uh, small components, adapters, and all those kinds of things, especially, for example, injectors uh, in our rocket engine, becomes very challenging with traditional uh, manufacturing techniques. So either you ask the manufacturer to produce about a thousand of those, and you get them at a reasonable price a piece, or uh, it takes forever to just produce one prototype. Additive uh, layer manufacturing is really a good way to, to get around that. And uh, we want to demonstrate usability and rapid turnaround. So in principle, the rocket, because it's a hybrid, lands, it's uh, uh, refueled, you put a new fuel cartridge in, you put uh, new locks in, and the rocket can fly again immediately. Uh, and since it's reusable and reflyable quickly, we, we hope to reduce costs, basically, with this. Um, how does that uh, look like? Uh, this is our rocket currently. We're flying in Sweden uh, from S-Range. Um, this is uh, some of our uh, trajectory calculation. So we're starting down here uh, in S range and we're then flying up to what is called extended zone B or zone C. Um, currently, because it's a it's a experimental rocket, they want us to fly at a fairly low uh, launching angle of about 80 degrees because they want to get the rocket away from the launch site as quickly as possible because it's experimental. Uh, once confidence is increased, uh, we can increase the launch angle to higher levels, 90 degrees upward, which which would then give us much more altitude. And we plan a launch uh, later this year. Uh, so the rocket is currently in manufacturing. Uh, most major components have been uh, given to the manufacturers, and we're still working on the, on the main engine at the moment. Uh, so we have the classical design. 
of an engine section with the fuel grain. Then we have the oxidizer and feed system. So we have an oxidizer tank for the LOX, which is about 14 kilograms of LOX. And uh, we ha then have a helium pressure and tank at the top. And it's all uh, operated by uh, pyrotechnic valves. Uh, the payload, uh, which would be interesting for, for uh, any kind of experiment, uh, at the moment it would just be interested for CANSATs, which is the pre-stage to CubeSats. Um, and uh, this this could be um, could be here. Uh, this can be extended, uh, however the the customer or the f uh, person likes it. And then we have the recovery system at the top, which is uh, the two-stage uh, parachute system. Um, we do actually have a, a payload for um, for our small flight, which is. Uh, hopefully above 12 kilometers, um, which is uh, the customer for that payload is Airbus DS, um, and they want to test thermoelectric generators uh, and onboard data transmission. So they want to test uh, how could you wirelessly transport uh, signals from sensors to uh, receiving stations onboard computers, uh, and what better way to do that in flight than on a small sounding rocket, um, which is uh, a good test bed for them and not very high risk because the, the costs are very, very minimal. Uh, so that's why they want to test it and they chose uh, thermoelectric gen generators because um, waste heat could be used to uh, power some electronics and uh, there's, there's many places in rockets where you get thermal gradients which could then be used to uh, power sensors in that region which saves you uh, a bunch of mass and uh, cabling. So um, this is basically our payload uh, for, this, for this first mission. Uh, the other payload is our own telemetry system on the rocket, uh, which is th which is then being used. So, um, in conclusion, we have uh, shown some uh, existing chemical propulsion options for CubeSats, um, also how they can be applied and uh, how they might be useful for CubeSats missions. And I have also shown a demonstrator rocket uh, that can be used to launch CubeSats in the future uh, once we upscale that version. So. Um, yeah, if you have uh, questions, um, because we're, we're doing this online, offline, uh, you can have uh, send all the questions you have to those email addresses, uh, and we'll be happy to answer the questions uh, offline at any time. So thank you very much for your attention, and uh, have a good day in Australia. Thank you.